Reconnaissance, to explore, to gather information, is both a medical and military term. Within the military, it's solely to actively try to determine an enemy's intentions through the collection of intelligence about strength, capabilities, geographical and environmental conditions. Such information today is usually gathered by specially trained military intelligence soldiers. However, reconnaissance isn't a recent occurrence. After all, it's often been argued that war is part of human nature. Archaeological findings support the notion that the culture of war can be traced back to prehistory, including control of information through secrecy and the identification of an enemy and his strength. Support can be found when looking at the evidence from major civilizations that invented writings such as Middle East cuneiform writings by the Sumerians 3000 BC and Arcadians 2500 BC. Egyptian hieroglyphic and hieratic script from 3000 BC. Other writings come from China, India, the Middle East, Greece and Central America. History supports the need for constant intelligence, i.e. some form of reconnaissance. However, it wasn't until after the French Revolution that the idea of airborne reconnaissance took form. The new rulers of France became interested in using balloons to observe the enemy's movements and appointed the scientist Charles Coutel to conduct experiments using l'entreprenant, meaning the undertaking. In reality, the first reconnaissance aircraft. A balloon was first used in 1794 in the war between France and Austria. In the Battle of Fleurus, the collected intelligence and the demoralizing effect on the Austrian troops ensured victory for the French. The very first winged reconnaissance flight in combat conditions took place during the Balkan Wars of 1912, on the 5th of October by a Greek and on the 16th of October by Bulgarian aircraft, Albatross biplanes. One of the very first aircraft used for reconnaissance was the German Rumpeltaube, when aviators like Fred Zim created new methods of surveillance and photography. This monoplane was particularly suitable, as its translucent wings made it extremely hard to detect. During the First World War, both reconnaissance aircraft and balloons were in use, though particularly the balloons were extremely vulnerable to enemy attacks. The result was that the balloon was phased out and demoted to the role of barrage balloon. At the end of the Great War, it had been established beyond any reasonable doubt that reconnaissance aircraft had become a valuable tool in any fighting force's armory, though it would still be some time before specialist aircraft became available. In actuality, virtually all reconnaissance aircraft deployed during World War II were converted from other primary uses. It wasn't until the post-war years that a real development of designated reconnaissance aircraft began. Though two centuries have gone by since the first balloon flew at the Battle of Fleurus, the mission of this cutting-edge E3 Sentry, weighing in at some 156 tons, used four turbofan engines rather than hot air and boasted a full complement of four flight crew and more than a dozen electronic observers had very much the same objective. Naturally, the 20th century did have more advanced and varied demands, and the last few decades has seen vast sums invested in specialized aircraft. There are many types of reconnaissance missions, and hence there are many contrasting kinds of reconnaissance aircraft. Here we present some of these incredible machines full of contrast, from the mighty Blackbird to the tiny Sentinel remotely piloted vehicle. The traditional form of modern aerial reconnaissance from the start of the US involvement with Vietnam 
was to use ordinary cameras on board, for example, a B-26 bomber. When returning to base, the film is processed and then the laborious and complex job of interpretation begins. This requires skilled photo analysts who can see details that others will miss and who understand their meaning. Today, ordinary cameras are amongst the sensors carried by a supersonic reconnaissance aircraft, the Northrop RF-FE Tiger Eye. A variety of cameras are installed under the redesigned nose, as well as infrared line scan sensors. A forward oblique camera can bring back images of the simplest targets, such as a dam, moving past 60 meters below at 1,000 kilometers an hour. Vertical cameras can be used in high-altitude overflights. So-called looking glass missions, getting their name from the fact that at 12,000 meters, they provide an exact duplicate of the ground-based command and control system of SAC, the US Air Force Strategic Air Command. Since 1971, a looking-glass aircraft has always been airborne. These aircraft are Boeing EC-135 and EC-135G. When in service, each has an officer of the rank of general on board, as well as a large team of controllers. If the Looking Glass EC-135s are impressive, this aircraft is truly magnificent. The Boeing E-4Bs are the heaviest, most powerful and likely the most expensive military aircraft in the Western world. Based on the airframe of the Boeing 747 Jumbo Jet, the E-4B is the United States Advanced Airborne Command Post. Powered by four General Electric turbofans, 44 tons, E-4Bs contain the most powerful and comprehensive communication systems ever built into an aircraft. The power required for these electronics is similar to the power of a diesel locomotive. The aerial refueling receptacle in the nose enables mission endurance to be extended to from 12 hours to a maximum of 72 hours. To be airborne for three full days is something of an achievement, as the aircraft accommodate a complement of 94 operatives.
The Canberra was a first-generation jet-powered light bomber developed by English Electric, designated PR-9. It was later built in the USA by Martin, designated B-57. The maiden flight took place on the 13th of May 1949 and it was introduced in 1951 and retired in 2006. In the B-57B version, it carried a crew of two, was 20 metres long, had a wingspan of 19.5 metres, empty weight was 12,285 kilograms, loaded weight 18,300 kilograms, and maximum takeoff weight 24,365 kilograms. It was powered by two Wright J65W5 turbojets, giving it a maximum speed of 960 kilometres an hour and a cruise speed of 765 kilometres an hour. The service ceiling was 13,745 metres, ferry range 14,389 kilometres and the rate of climb 31.4 metres per second. It was armed by four 20mm M39 cannons and approximately 3,300 kilograms of mixed ordnance. Avionics included APW-11 Bombing Air Radar Guidance Shoran Bombing System, APS-54 Radar Warning Receiver. Originally designed as a light bomber, the camera was very adaptable and served in a variety of roles including photographic, electronic and meteorological reconnaissance. The Canberra originated as a replacement for the high-altitude de Havilland Mosquito and English Electric was one of the companies shortlisted to proceed with the development. When the Korean War broke out in 1950, the US Air Force was in serious need of an all-weather interdiction aircraft as the piston-engine Douglas A-26 invaders were in short supply. So they issued a request for a jet-powered bomber with a top speed of 1,020 kilometers an hour, ceiling of 12,190 meters and a 1,850 kilometer range. Full all-weather capability and secondary reconnaissance role had to be included. After fierce competition and a fly-off against the XB-51, the English Electric emerged as clear winner. But since the English manufacturers couldn't produce enough aircraft for both the RAF and the US Air Force, on the 3rd of April 1951, Martin was granted the license to build Canberra's, the B-57, a very successful aircraft. The Lockheed U-2, the Dragon Lady, is a single-engine, high-altitude aircraft providing all-weather surveillance. It first flew on the 1st of August 1955 and it is still in service. It is crewed by a single pilot, is 19.2 metres long with a wingspan of 31.4 metres, empty weight is 6,760 kilograms and maximum takeoff weight 18,100 kilograms. It's powered by a single General Electric F-118-101 turbojet and has a top speed of 805 kilometers an hour. It will cruise at 690 kilometers an hour. The range is 10,300 kilometers and flight endurance is 12 hours. When the tension of the Cold War was rising in the early 1950s, the US military needed a better strategic reconnaissance aircraft to determine Soviet capabilities and intentions. Existing surveillance aircraft were mainly converted bombers and as such vulnerable to enemy firepower. The Americans needed an aircraft that could operate above 21,000 meters beyond Soviet fighters, missiles and radar. This would make it possible to overfly and knowingly violate a country's airspace while taking aerial photographs. Both the U-2 and the variant TR-1 met the needs, but the design made them hard to fly and particularly to land. The flexing of the very long wings means that landing is quite hairy and has to be followed by a chase car to give the pilot the precise location where he is in relation to the runway. The chase car follows as close as it can get, calling up the gap between the rear wheel and the runway. It's important to keep the wingtips off the ground. For each mission, the pilot needs a pressure suit and the cockpit and many other parts need a high-capacity environmental control system. 
Departure on an operational mission comes after many days of intensive work by many specialists. The reconnaissance sensors are packaged in the long nose and in long pods well out along the wings. The various assortments of photographic, return beam vidicoms and anti-spectral cameras, side-looking radars and synthetic aperture radar can weigh as much as two tons. As the aircraft takes off, its outrigger legs and wheels are jettisoned. When U-2 and TR-1 fly today, it's generally classified information, but we may be sure that each mission is planned with extreme care. The new TR-1, packed with advanced sensors, fly mainly in the European theater. The days of direct superpower confrontation are receding, but the U-2R still fly vital missions in many parts of the world, of the kind where any mistake can have far-reaching consequences. Despite all early resistance to the U-2 TR-1, and though only 86 were ever built, they have now flown for more than half a century and might fly for some time to come, even if the public best remember them for the Gary Powers incident and their work during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This crisis involving the USA, the Soviet Union and Cuba was probably one of the most severe post-war incidents and one that took the world too close to war for comfort. The RF-4 Phantom II is the reconnaissance version of the F-4, a long-range supersonic fighter bomber, hence the R in its designation. The maiden flight took place on the 27th of May 1958, and the aircraft was introduced into service in December 1960. The Phantom carries a crew of two. The length is 19.2 meters, wingspan 11.7 meters, loaded weight is 18,827 kilograms, and maximum takeoff weight 28,030 kilograms. It's powered by two General Electric J79 GE17A turbojets, giving it a maximum speed of 2,370 kilometers an hour and a cruise speed of 940 kilometers an hour. The service ceiling is 18,300 meters. Ferry range 2,600 kilometers with two external fuel tanks. The rate of climb is 210 meters per second. When the Phantom first entered service in 1960, it became a major part of American air power and retained that status throughout the 1970s and 80s. It was gradually replaced by more modern aircraft, notably the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, the F-14 Tomcat and the F-A-18 Hornet. It remained in service in the reconnaissance role and served as such in the 1991 Gulf War and finally left service in 1996, though it is still active in non-American services. Notably, Israeli phantoms saw extensive service in many Israeli-Arab conflicts, and Iraq used its large fleet of phantoms in the Iran-Iraq war, and the US used them for target practice. A total of 5,195 Phantoms were built from 1958 to 1981. This makes it the second most produced Western jet fighter behind the F-86 Sabre at just under 10,000. The Phantom was designed as a fleet defense fighter for the US Navy and was later adopted by the US Air Force as well, 
Until the F-15 came on the scene, the Phantom held the record for the longest continuous production for a fighter with a 24-year run. Innovations in the Phantom included an advanced pulse Doppler radar and extensive use of titanium in its airframe. Despite its dimensions and a 27,000 kilogram takeoff weight, the Phantom still achieved an impressive top speed of Mach 2.23 and a climb rate of more than 210 meters per second. In fact, shortly after coming into service, the Phantom set no less than 15 world records, including an absolute speed record of 2,585 kilometers an hour and an absolute altitude record of 30,040 meters. Even though set in 1959 to 62, five of the Phantom's speed records were not broken until 1975 when the F-15 Eagle entered service. The Phantom completed carrier qualifications in October 1961 and its first full carrier deployment began in August 1962 aboard USS Forrestal. The second deployable U.S. Atlantic Fleet Squadron to receive the Phantom was the VF-102 Diamondback, shortly followed by the U.S. Pacific Fleet's VF-114 Aardvox. The fighter-bomber version of the Phantom served in many conflicts, including the Tonkin Gulf incident, flying the first combat sortie of the Vietnam War on the 5th of August 1964. Flying a Phantom, Commander Thomas Page and Lieutenant John Smith shot down the first North Vietnamese MiG on the 17th of June 1965. The reconnaissance version was operated by four squadrons in East Asia and was also deployed during the first Gulf War. Here, protective hangars are being erected on a base established in Saudi Arabia. The RF-4C taking off here is a typical example of a fighter that has been converted to reconnaissance duties. During its deployment, the RF-4C was progressively upgraded with new sensors and other mission equipment. One of 15 wings of the US Air Force flying this aircraft is the 10th Tactical Reconnaissance Wing based in England. Many times each day and night, the 10th flies missions which not only hone the skills of the pilots but also bring back valuable information. In Vietnam, the chief reconnaissance aircraft was the RF-101 and the RF-4. The reconnaissance Phantom can go in at either high or low level and as fast as most combat jets. It has no weapons but various electronic aids to help it navigate and survive in hostile airspace. The two main recon centers are the oblique, lateral and panoramic cameras in the nose. An SLAR, sideways looking airborne radar, is on the underside of the fuselage and an ILRS, infrared line scan unit, is just behind the SLAR. This equipment produces different kinds of high definition images, including horizon to horizon. The ILRS gives thermal pictures, which among other things, can detect enemy activities at night. Camera film can be processed in flight and ejected over a ground pickup point, while radar and IR imagery can be transmitted. Actual combat reconnaissance doesn't come much better. The North American A-5 Vigilante was a carrier-based super bomber with a short service in a nuclear strike role. It did better as a designated reconnaissance aircraft. 
It first flew on the 31st of August 1958 and was introduced in 1961 to be retired in 1979. It was flown by a crew of two, was 23.32 metres long and had a wingspan of 16.15 metres. Empty weight was 14,800 kilograms, loaded weight 21,580 kilograms and the maximum takeoff weight 28,580 kilograms. The Vigilante was powered by two General Electric J79 GE8 turbojet engines, giving a maximum speed of 2,123 kilometres an hour. The service ceiling was 15,880 metres, the range 2,075 kilometres and the rate of climb 40.6 metres per second. It's an impressive array of advanced aircraft taking off from this carrier. First an F-4J Phantom, next an A-4 Skyhawk on a practice attack mission, then another F-4, and finally a mighty R-5C Vigilante for a far-ranging reconnaissance mission. The vigilante was particularly active in Vietnam, such as here at Tan Ninh, where they delivered a fair amount of ordnance before they were limited to reconnaissance. The reconnaissance version, the IRA-5C, has slightly larger wings and a fairing under the fuselage for a multi-sensor reconnaissance pack, including APD-7 radar, AAS-21 infrared line scanner and camera pack, and more. This version of the Vigilante weighed almost five tons more than the strike version, though this cost in terms of acceleration and climb rate, it remained fast in level flight. The Lockheed P-3 Orion is a patrol aircraft mainly used for maritime patrol, anti-submarine warfare and reconnaissance. Its maiden flight took place 25th of November 1959 and was introduced into service in 1962 and is still active. The Orion carried a crew of 11, pilot, co-pilot, third pilot, first and second flight engineer, tactical coordinator, navigator, acoustic sensor operator 1, 2 and 3 and in-flight technician. The length is 35.6 metres, the wingspan 30.4 metres, empty weight 35,000 kilograms, loaded weight 61,400 kilograms and maximum takeoff weight 64,400 kilograms. The power plant is four Allison T56A14 turboprops, allowing for a maximum speed of 750 kilometres an hour and a cruise speed of 610 kilometres an hour. Service ceiling is 10,400 metres, the range 9,000 kilometres and the rate of climb 16 metres per second. Armament consists of 9,000 kilogram bomb load, AGM Harpoon, AGM 84E Slam and AGM 65 Maverick missiles. In addition, there are sonar buoys, torpedoes, mines and depth charges. The P-3 is an extremely versatile aircraft and over the years more than 40 variants have been developed, mainly because of its rugged reliability as a platform, flying missions lasting more than 12 hours, only 60 to 70 meters over salt water, it still maintains a good safety record. It is used in research, hurricane hunting, customs drug control, NASA research and the CIA has several for aerial surveillance, plus more. The P-3 can patrol for three hours at a radius of 2,400 kilometers. Like the Nimrod, it can conserve fuel by shutting down one or even two engines after arriving on the station. As usual, the P-3 has radar ESM gear and a mad stinger in the tail, but in the ASW role, the chief sensing technique is underwater acoustics using sonar buoys, whose outputs are analyzed by advanced processing electronics. Sonar boys can detect the precise acoustic signature which reveals the presence of a submarine, which is immediately reported to the aircraft. Then the library of acoustic traces is compared with the new unknown trace to identify the actual type of submarine. Oh. 
Sometimes a submarine is spotted on the surface. All sonar boy data like that from other sensors is fed to the main computer. Humans could never begin to handle the amount of information received, so the computers compile and constantly update the stream of data. Each P3C can carry up to 10 tons of weapons in a shallow internal bay and on 10 underwing pylons. The load can include eight anti-submarine torpedoes and three nuclear depth charges. Up to six Harpoon cruise missiles can also be carried for attacking surface vessels. Like other patrol aircraft, the P-3 duties range from putting down a geometric correct pattern of sonar boys to humanitarian search and rescue, or police duty, such as offshore surveillance and anti-smuggling missions. For these type of duties, the SLIR turret under the nose really comes into its own, presenting the crew with clear pictures of objects of interest at night or in bad weather. Every bit of data gathered by the sensors can be transmitted to a shore base a friendly ship or another P3C. In any case, everything is recorded on the tape for later analysis. Though powered by turboprops, the P3 is quite fast, as it's comparatively light and has a maximum speed of 750 kilometers an hour. By 1988, the US Navy had already defined an update for the P3C and is currently studying the next generation replacement. The Grumman E-2 Hawkeye is an American all-weather carrier-based tactical airborne early warning aircraft. It first flew in 1960 and was introduced in January 1964 and has not yet been retired. It carries a crew of five, two pilots and three naval flight officers. It is 17.56 meters long and has a wingspan of 24.58 meters. Empty weight is 17,090 kilograms. Loaded weight, 23,391 kilograms, and maximum takeoff weight is also 23,391 kilograms. The power is supplied by two Allison T56A 425 or 427 turboprops, producing a maximum speed of 604 kilometers an hour. The service ceiling is 9,390 meters, range 2,583 kilometers, and the rate of climb 13 meters per second. Hawkeye provides all-weather airborne early warning and command and control functions for the carrier battle group, here being launched ahead of the Hornets during the first Gulf War. The Hawkeye uses computerized sensors to provide early warning, threat analysis and control of counteraction against air and surface targets. The Hornets are followed by the heavier and larger F-14 Tomcats, the star of the film Top Gun. And finally, Invaders and Prowlers are launched.
The Hawkeye has a lot of fighters to look after, as seen here on the deck of this carrier. The Hawkeye has one distinct advantage over the sentry, here seen aloft. It can be carrier-based. Whilst the sentry can carry heavier and to a degree more advanced equipment, it is dependent on its land-based stations and hence not as mobile or as quickly deployable as the more nimble Hawkeye. This is particularly true when deployment for battle is demanding in terms of time a situation that occurred when General Schwarzkopf had to call for air cover during the attack on Iraqi forces. The latest version of the E-2, the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, is currently being developed and the first two, Delta-1 and Delta-2, are flight testing. The E-2D has a completely new avionics suite, including a new APY-9 radar, radio suite, mission computer, integrated satellite communications capability, flight management system, improved engines, a new glass cockpit and the ability to refuel in flight. The first flight was the 3rd of August 2007 and introduction is expected by 2011. Hawkeye's operating as the eyes and ears of these fighter bombers has helped take reconnaissance into the 21st century. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was an advanced, long-range Mach 3 strategic reconnaissance aircraft. Its maiden flight was on the 22nd of December 1964. It was introduced in 1966 and retired in 1998. It carried a crew of two, was 32.74 metres long, had a wingspan of 16.94 metres, empty weight was 30,600 kilograms, loaded weight 77,000 kilograms, and maximum takeoff weight was 78,000 kilograms. It was powered by two Pratt & Whitney J58-1 afterburning turbojets and could reach a maximum speed of 3,530 kilometres an hour at 24,000 metres. The service ceiling was 25,900 metres, the range 5,400 kilometres, the ferry range 5,925 kilometres, and the rate of climb 60 metres per second. Manufactured by Lockheed, a company with an impressive reputation for building advanced aircraft, this amazing place created one of the most remarkable families of aircraft of all time, this Blackbird. And like the U-2, these aircraft were created to fill a need. It is said that the Blackbird sorts out the difference between what people may say they can do and what they actually do. In the end, the success of each mission comes down to two people, the RSO and the pilot. They have a heavy workload. They are the elite of the elite.
At full speed, the power of the Blackbird's engines is greater than that of 45 diesel locomotives, or the biggest Atlantic liner ever built. Any day, they could have beaten the world record for speed and for sustained altitude, but its purpose was not publicity. It was to gather information at the rate of billions of bits per second. The full story of the SR-71 and how they operate can't yet be told, but we do know that supported by their special tankers, they could go to almost any place on Earth. The precursor to the SR-71, the A-12 Oxcart, was designed by Kelly Johnson at the Lockheed Skunk Work, and he was also the chief designer of the Blackbird. During the 1964 presidential campaign in the USA, Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee, criticized President Lyndon B. Johnson for falling behind the Soviet Union in research and development of new weapons systems. Johnson decided to answer this criticism by releasing information of the highly classified A-12 program and later the existence of a reconnaissance version, the SR-71. The people at the Skunk Works were shocked, but the Blackbird still flew on time. As it was, the Blackbird flew its missions more like a spacecraft than an aircraft. It flies at an impressive Mach 3 Plus and is extremely difficult to register on radar. Every flight is planned like a space mission. Hundreds of experts concentrating on the work of just two men, the pilot and the RSO, the reconnaissance systems officer, who are dressed in full pressure flying suits, just like astronauts. In the rear cockpit, the RSO manages cameras similar to those carried by spy satellites and conning radars and infrared sensors, though details are classified. For the safety of the crew, escape systems that can operate at over 35,000 meters had been developed, safety further enhanced by the use of predominantly heat-resistant material that can withstand the high temperatures and forces when the SR-71 flies faster than a bullet.
A further consideration when designing the Blackbird was king in the late 1950s that altitude was no longer giving immunity from interception. Enormous speed was also needed, and Mach 3 was the target. A Mach 3 aircraft cannot be made of aluminium. Titanium was needed. A fantastic effort was made to fashion these very difficult metals to virtually the whole airframe. Into this amazing aircraft step a pilot and a reconnaissance systems officer, suited like astronauts, virtually preparing for a journey into space. Every single thing was new and had to be invented, produced and tested. The hydraulic system had to be designed to work at temperatures much hotter than any domestic oven. Even the fuel had to be special to remain stable at extremely high temperatures and also serve with the cooling fluid of the avionics systems. They would be fed by special KC-135Q tankers, which is proof against having any lighted matches drop in. Not the least of the features of the Blackbird was that it was designed to be difficult to see on radar. It was, to a degree, the very first stealth design. Construction of the SR-71 was also an extraordinary achievement as it took only 22 months and all was done in total secrecy, President Johnson notwithstanding. The first Blackbirds were called A-12s and here in a remote part of the Nevada desert called Groom Lake, the maiden flight took place. Development was fast with up to 18 aircraft in the flight line. Two were prototypes of the long-range interceptor with a huge radar in the nose, flanked on either side by infrared receiver sensors, which are absent from today's US fighters. Underneath was a missile bay from where an AIM-47 could be launched. However, the real need was for the SR-71 strategic reconnaissance platform. This was made slightly longer and much heavier than its predecessor, mainly because of the fuel required to fly long missions. One SR-71A was converted into this SR-71C trainer, and others were built as dual-controlled SR-71Bs. All Blackbirds are powered by the unique Pratt & Whitney J58 turbo ramjet engine. At Mach 3, most of the thrust comes from the giant spike of the inlet. Nearly all the rest is contributed by the huge afterburner, which quickly becomes white hot. One of the important aspects of training is to teach already experienced pilots how to manage a situation wherein the engine inlet unsettles the aircraft, which tries to swap ends at Mach 3. The inward sloping rudders are fully powered and can work in unison or in opposition. There are no fins. On landing, the enormous aircraft is slowed by a large chute. Before each mission, the crew eat a high-protein breakfast and again study the mission plan, which is refined over the last few days. 
At last, the pilot and the RSO walk slowly out to their aircraft, which is being fussed over by mission specialists, concerned about the many tons of highly classified equipment on board. It's been said that the long focus optical cameras can take pictures from 30,000 meters in which you can almost read a newspaper. There are return beam vidicons and sideways looking radars. Last task checks are completed en route to the runway. The Blackbird's operational story is quite varied. Since its first flight at Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, the first SR-71 to enter service was delivered to the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base, California in 1966 and stayed in service with the Strategic Air Command through to 1991. SR-71s arrived at the 9th SRW's operation location at Kadena Air Base, Okinawa. From here it flew, amongst other missions, reconnaissance over Vietnam, codename Giant Scale. From the beginning of the Blackbird's reconnaissance missions over enemy territories such as North Vietnam and Laos, in 1968, the SR-71s averaged approximately one sortie per week for almost two years. By 1970, the average was two sorties per week, and by 1972, they were flying nearly one sortie per day. Many years later, in April 1986, it was essential to photograph the target in Libya, and the SR-71 came back with the needed pictures. This was an unusual mission which ultimately met with success. Occasionally, SR-71s left Nodenhall in England and various other bases only to fly along frontiers, not across them. The SR-71 had, from the very beginning, an impressive reputation. 
and during the 1989 air show it attracted massive attention, not least from a large Soviet contingent. It may certainly be considered a shame that this great aircraft does no longer fly. The Boeing E3 Sentry is an American Airborne Warning and Control System, AWACS, aircraft. It first flew with full E3A avionics on the 25th of May 1976 and was introduced in 1977 and it is still active. It has a flight crew of four and a mission crew of 13 to 19. It is 46.61 meters long, has a wingspan of 44.42 meters, its empty weight is 73,480 kilograms, loaded weight, including aerial refueling, is 156,400 kilograms, and a maximum takeoff weight of 147,000 kilograms. It is powered by four Pratt & Whitney TF33 PW100A turbofan and can attain a maximum speed of 855 kilometers an hour. The service ceiling is 12,500 meters and the range 7,400 kilometers. Compared to the SR-71, the E3 Sentry appears very ordinary, but they are, in their own right, very impressive. The Sentry's role is to keep station at a height of about 9,600 meters and using a unique combination of sensors serve as an AWACS platform. AWACS stands for Airborne Warning and Control System. The Sentry is based on the airframe of a Boeing 707 commercial transport aircraft rather than the EC-135 and can stay on station 16,000 kilometers from its base for six hours. The Sentry is manned by a flight crew of four and a mission crew of 14 AWACS technicians who sit at consoles and desks, handling surveillance, data, type of identification, communication, navigation and other tasks. By far the biggest sensor is the Westinghouse APY-1 surveillance radar, whose antennae is a giant beam rotating above the fuselage. This beam is aerodynamically shaped like a discus. A sentry can keep track of all friendly and hostile aircraft and any other objects up to a distance of approximately 400 kilometers in all directions. The E-3 is able to direct friendly fighters to within range of an enemy, where they can intercept and cover the intruder with their own radar. If needed, it can be refueled in flight to extend mission endurance to 20 hours or more. The latest models of reconnaissance and surveillance aircraft give a whole new meaning to Big Brother is watching you.